Greetings, Gerbonauts. This is Gerbil Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number, are you ready? 4040, episode 40 of Project Odyssey. And today we are going to start our trip. Well, maybe not really the trip, but the, the construction of the vessel that is going to take us to Duna. It is the actual crew carrier, currently not inhabited by any Kerbals. We're going to be assembling it in orbit. It is big. We have a lot of Kerbals we need to take to Duna. The name of this vessel is going to be the Copernicus, with a K. Named after an early, very famous Kerbal astronomer. But before we go any further, let's take a look at the inspiration of this mission. It's loosely based on what was cancelled by NASA, a trip to Mars in our universe called the Constellation Missions. The basic idea with these was that unmanned ships would go ahead well before the crew land on Mars and deliver supplies necessary to live there, habitation, fuel production, that sort of thing. Then the crew would travel there in the ship that you're seeing here. After making their long journey, they would transfer down to the surface by going in one of those earlier pre-launched automated vehicles, carry out their ground research, and then sometime later when the launch window was right again, they would head back up to their transfer vehicle that would take them back to Earth. Well, my Copernicus is very close, it's, it resembles this craft. But at the same time, this is Kerbal Space Program, and we need to apply some Russian engineering techniques. In other words, let's make it big. If it's worth building, it's worth building big. In order to do that, I'm also being inspired by a movie. In this case, the Interstellar Craft. So I started by sketching out the basic design of my craft, where it's a melding, a merging of the ideas between Constellation and the Endurance. And that's what led me to this. And I spent a lot of time working out the parts in the VAB and assembling it all there in the VAB to make sure that everything would fit together, getting the angles just right, and making a bunch of new parts, and then realizing that I was going to need a new launcher for this because it's so big. The pre-launch mass is 1,500 tons. It is 90 meters tall and seven and a half meters in diameter. Nine meters in diameter down at the base and up around the fairing. And this is just one segment of the launch. By my estimate, I'm going to need about 10 to 12 launches to have this fully assembled and fully crewed. And because this was a new launcher and only one small piece of a much larger ship, lots of testing went into this as well as several simulated launches trying to perfect our new larger sized launcher. There are several newly constructed parts that have gone into this. All of them needed simulated testing to destruction. These early launches were for some reason completely uncontrollable. They would go up about a thousand meters and then they would start flipping over. And no matter how much gimbal I had on the engines, they just couldn't compensate for it as if something in the payload were unbalanced. But I would take it back to the VAB and look at the center of mass and it was always right in the middle. It was exactly where I thought it should be. I fiddled with ferrum aerospace values, I fiddled with mass values, and finally I tracked it down to a problem with the way that the engines were mounted. I'll show you that a little bit later in the VAB. But the answer was we needed a special mounting plate that we could put the engines on. After that, it was the usual sequence of problems. The retro engines were either not strong enough or started tipping it a little bit too early. When some of the struts weren't placed correctly, it was doing a little bit of spinning. Other places needed some struts. The engines were new, so I had to fix the flames that were coming out of them and making new smoke. Fuel levels needed to be checked. The staging needed to be fixed up in some cases. Action groups needed to be created. The RCS had to be set up. Mono needed to be filled into the tanks. I put a stack separator on the top in order to make sure that some struts would disappear. The duration of the boosters had to be adjusted to get just the right delta V. All this and more went into getting that going. But finally, here we are making our way into orbit. 
This is so big and heavy that as the first stage cuts out here, you can see one of the changes I had to make right here. The retro boosters down on the bottom stage weren't quite enough to pull it away at a speed that I was happy with, so I had to put some eulage type boosters on the upper stage at the same time. The bottom also has the sort of sideways, slow burning retros that make it tip out of the way just to make sure that after it's cleared that engine, it goes sideways and has absolutely no chance of coming back and striking anything on the upper stage. After that, our brand new second stage 7.5 meter engine ignites. This one is burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. I figured because the stage is so big, that'll give me plenty of volume to put in all that hydrogen because hydrogen is so light that it takes a very large stage sometimes to get any sort of delta V out of it. Well, as the second stage is now temporarily cutting out, we'll burn that again in just a minute. Let's switch into the VAB to look at some of the construction tips and tricks that I had to use in order to get this built. And one of the first here, as you can see, is that it doesn't fit inside the VAB, so I had to use the hangar extensions mod in order to make my internal VAB a little bit bigger to gain access to the entire craft. So now let's just scroll ourselves back to the bottom and I can show you one of the new parts I had to build to make this. Here at the bottom, you can see that I have a bunch of boosters all around the outside. Those aren't really part of the, the new construction. Those are just regular old boosters and decouplers that I've used before. And the bottom has a whole bunch of retro boosters all around the outside, as well as my new technique I like, where I put one sideways that makes it rotate out of the way after it's pulled back. But none of that is new either. What is new is down here we have a new engine plate. This engine plate was constructed because the way that I had the engines mounted previously was exactly what was causing it to go out of control. I'll show you that just for a second actually. So I had taken that and gone over here and because I didn't have the engines set up to be mountable on the surface, let me grab one here and show you. See, these are not surface mountable and I could have made them surface mountable, but at the same time, I wasn't sure I was going to like the look of the open bottom here. Well, because they weren't surface mountable, I took one of these brackets and I surface mounted that down on the bottom and I symmetried that around a whole bunch of times like this. And then I took the engines and I attached them like that. And for whatever reason, that made the rocket go out of control. The way that I solved it was by creating this plate. Now I did that by going over and taking a plate that I already had. This adapter plate right here. I took one of those, flipped it upside down, scaled it to be bigger because as you can see here, this one, if we attach that, look how small that is. So that needed to be scaled much bigger in order to accommodate all these engines. But then also it doesn't have any nodes. You can see right there, if I grab one of those engines, once again, that is only a single node that it can attach to right there. So that had to be solved as well. So if we take this back here and we put that on, you can see as I take these engines off that there are a whole bunch of nodes on that thrust plate. So here at the base level of the thrust plate there, you can see eight different locations where engines can be attached. So that was part number one that was new. And if we work our way up here, we'll see what else we've got that's new taking away the lower stage and then pulling away our avionics ring as well as our decoupler. That is a new second stage engine. I said earlier it works on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. I had to make that one special because one thing I have discovered from all the different engine making that I do is as you scale the engines up to different sizes, like if I took this one and I said, I want to make that bigger and did something like that, the engine effects that come out don't get scaled up with it. So the fire that comes out will be too small relative to the engines. If it was a small engine that got scaled up, the fire will look about as big as it should for this. And when it starts coming out of this, it looks kind of stupid. To compensate for that, we have to make a special engine for every diameter that we're going to want. And so that's where this one from AIES comes in. I mounted this one. Uh, up underneath right here after I had put these little brackets on. The brackets allowed me to have some 
low RCS and on the back side here is the hydrazine that powers them. And then this just goes on in between. And by doing that, gives me more control because these jets are now farther away from the center of mass, which is going to be up here. You can see the little ye yellow dot up there. It might have been a little bit lower with the engine still attached, but still, the further away that these get from that, the more torque you're going to get when you're using your RCS. Next up, you can see the eulage boosters that I was talking about up here on this avionics ring. I had found that the ones that were down in the first stage weren't pulling it off the engine fast enough because that lower stage was so heavy so I put six up here pointing down so that this part pushes away at the same time that the bottom part is pulling down. Now if we continue our way up the side here you can see that we've got more lights and up here more lights. And finally as we scroll up here and take a look at what's underneath this fairing we're going to see what the clamshell fairing is now opening using its special own version of retro boosters to throw the clamshell pieces well away from the payload and prevent any kind of damage to now reveal the core module of the interplanetary travel spaceship known as the Copernicus. And the first thing we do with this after activating the RCS on the upper stage is begin a tip to slowly rotate the whole craft into the proper position for its second to burn. That is still several minutes away in game time. The initial apoapsis for this burn was up around 500 kilometers, and that was intentional. It isn't that I'm going to circularize at 500 kilometers. Instead, I'm going to leave the eccentric orbit. As long as we have the periapsis lined up so that at the next time that our launch window for Duna comes, that that's where we'll be making our burn, this technique will give me the extra speed I need so that I don't have to pack as much fuel on the transfer stage. Instead, this initial booster right here and the flights that are going to help assemble it have provided a lot of the delta V that it's going to take in order to get escape velocity by coming up at 500 kilometers but then only going back down to around 70 to 80 kilometers on our periapsis. We'll be taking advantage of the Oberth effect when we make our exit burn. Now before we finish with this orbital insertion, let's take a look at what's happening down on the ground. I know you've all got a lot of questions about the alternate dimension, so I called this meeting to clear things up. We've questioned the captives, and with information they've given us, and with the help of Svetlana, I believe we can piece together what's going on. Ultimately, this all comes back to Bob and Kesla. Before Project Gateway, Bob was conducting experiments on a new energy source. Kesla offered some suggestions for improvements, and they carried out additional tests on Minmus back in our dimension. As you all know, things went wrong that day, and they caused a space-time rift to tear open, exposing our universe to the effects of many alternate dimensions. Time distortions, material dimensional shifting, and so on. What we didn't know then was that it had affected many other dimensions as well, including the ones Svetlana used to call home. Her world had been devastated far worse than even ours. Their people were desperate to find an answer, but were having no luck despite having better technology than us. We had advantages. We knew what had caused the problem, since it was us who had caused it. We also possessed the largest supply of dimensional shifted material, including the Omega-13 and plans to a space station that could house it and power it. We almost succeeded too, except we ran out of time and our sun went supernova, shifting us to a second dimension. But we know time is fluid. A future version of Kesla, Bob, and Joseph had gone back in time to warn younger Joseph about building the Omega-13 and how it would destroy the solar system. Armed with that information, he tried to stop the construction, and he almost succeeded. But in the alternate timeline, Joseph had been in charge of the program. In our timeline, Joseph was originally against us. This tells us time is not a constant. We can change things, and that means we can fix our solar system. We can reverse the supernova. And that brings us back to Svetlana and her people. We can reverse what has happened to them as well, but only if we work together. Get them to work with us, not against us. 
that's going to be the hard part because they blame us for what happened to their people, and rightly so. We have them in holding cells for now over in the R&D building. Bill is with them because he's been somehow brainwashed into believing he's against us. Neil has a plan to deprogram him. So where does that leave us? Later today, we're launching the first part of the Copernicus. Bob has put together blueprints for a huge ship that can carry many of us to Duna where we'll find the other half of the artifact that we need to bring back here to this Kerbin to open the time rift that will send us all back to where this began, and this time prevent the rift that caused this whole mess in the first place. As for the alternate Kerbals, they've given us communications frequencies to contact their ship in orbit, or at least they say it's in orbit, but we've yet to get a response from any of our hailing attempts. We captured their leader and he's in a cell, Kamalak. He may have given us false information to protect his ship about the frequencies. Scans have revealed nothing, but he says they have a thing called a cloaking device that can hide it from our scans. They also have warp capability, interdimensional communications, and transporters. All of this tech would be immensely useful if we could get our hands on it, but as I said, so far no contact. They claim they came here to get a device from us, ironically, with all their advanced tech, we have what they needed to get back to their dimension. Sadly, it was lost in the explosion back at our last base, so they're stuck here with us. But I'm willing to offer our help in returning them home as soon as we figure out how to operate the portal we're going to build. And before that can happen, we need to get to Duna. So let's all get back to work, see if we can get this first module of the Copernicus launched. Any questions? Great, let's get to it. So we return now to 500 kilometers above Kerbin's surface. You can see that we are still suborbital, so it's time to start up that second stage one more time here at the apoapsis and bring up that periapsis to at least out of the atmosphere. 70 to 80 kilometers is what we're targeting. At that point, we will have a nice little elliptical orbit where we'll be going very fast as we come back around to that periapsis. After that, we can dispose of that injection stage, flip it around, and head it back toward carbon. There's no propulsion on the core, even though it does carry a lot of fuel for later. So we're using that injection stage one last time to rotate the solar panel to face the sun. Once we see that we have the sun pouring down upon it, then we can activate those retro boosters, slowly dragging that stage away very gently to make sure that nothing collides anywhere. In fact, it seems I set them to slow burn so slowly that even several seconds later when it's time for me to start that flip to send it back to curb and they're still going. So for just a moment now, they're going to be going the wrong way. However, I'm not too worried about that. We're far enough away that once we activate the engine, we're going to be going much faster than those little slow burn retros are pushing us. After that, we power up enough to get us down into about 20 to 25 kilometers over the surface, which should burn us up and then switch back to our payload. Right before we switched over to flip the injection stage and send it back, I had decoupled the stack separator that was up on top of the core module. That stack separator had our struts attached to it. I let it drift away a little bit, so now when I flip back to take a look at it, you can see that that separator is beginning to go a little bit further, and it'll continue doing that until it's well away from our module. Before I completely take away that fairing, take a look up here and see that I've used the special plates that are installed in the fairing to make a nice attachment point for one end of a strut. And then the other end of the strut went down to this stack separator that it's attached to up here on top of the payload. So once we get rid of that fairing, we'll release the stack separator and the endpoints of that strut will also go away. I'm not sure why it's not coming off. Normally, if you attach it first to the part that's going to decouple and then down to the payload, the endpoint just falls off as debris. But it wasn't working in this case. I tried it in both directions and the endpoints were staying attached to my payload so I had to do something to get them to go away and that is put on this little stack separator. Now we'll take away the other side of the clamshell fairing and you can see the payload that we've already seen in orbit. We'll just take off the bottom fairing part here 
And you can see that the part count for this whole thing is only 24. And that's going to be important because this whole craft is going to have a lot of parts on it if I'm not careful about the number of parts that go into making this. On a piece by piece basis, that is. So up at the top, we have a habitation module. And around the sides, we have three large solar panels, each one of them capable of providing enough power to power the entire station once it's fully built. That's intentional because we know that even though Bill isn't around right now, demanding that we keep our redundancy rule, we should honor that request and put in three panels so that if one of them breaks, we still have a primary one and a backup. Down around the side here, on each side, we have three cooling radiators. Those should provide enough cooling to take care of the entire station. And then here we have more lights. Down to only 10 parts now, and you can see there's a lot of complexity in there for only 10 parts. At the bottom, we have our docking node right there. And up here, we have an extra docking node. This one provides crew access and resupply access. There's a habitation module in here, and I'll get to why that is separate from everything else in just a second. Down to only nine parts. So if we come into here and grab this, you can see that this one is three because this is part of a larger fuel tank that also has retros on it. One here and one on the other side. You can see it's sort of ghostly right there. This bottom piece also has the same thing. See right here, we got the tank and we have a retro there and a retro there. These are attached to a decoupler right in here. So once I am done with that fuel, those will decouple and it will retro itself right out of that slot. So now you can see we are down to three parts and that's because we have one whole big thing here and one decoupler there and one decoupler there. After having taken off the decouplers, we're down to one part. So you can see this is a welded part. It has some strut segments and some end plates here and down in here. Those are at specific positions to make sure everything fits correctly. It has our core module scaled up nice and big right inside there and a crew hab up here at the top. Now, the reason why I had this one separated instead of welded in is this one has a light module attached to it. And this one has the exact same light module. You can't have two of the same light module in something in a lot of cases when you weld the parts together or else the lights won't turn on. So by keeping this piece separate, I can turn this one on and off with this button right here. See, that's turning the lights on and off right up there. And then down here, I can turn those lights on and off independently. The alternative would be these would turn on and off, but if this was welded, these would not turn on and off at the same time. That is true of many light modules, although I have found that the surface lights tend to stay on. So it's okay to weld surface lights, but in this case, this one doesn't stay on after it's been welded. With surface lights welded in, only one of the lights is toggleable on and off, but that's okay if all the others stay on. And as for why most of the rest of the parts weren't also welded in, well, you can't weld more than one docking port into a part. And I already have modified this to say that the node right here is a docking port. That's why the one at the bottom and up here at the top were independently attached. And as for the solar panels and the radiators, well, you can't have more than one module of something attached and usually you can't have things that animate attached. And so since those extend out and animate, I needed those to be separate parts as well. Now, unlike past stations, this ship is going to require a little bit of construction as it gets built. So we're going to send up some crew right away. The very next launch is going to be life support. So they're not going to be there for very long without life support. And if the second launch gets delayed, then they'll just come back a little bit early but we need to be accelerating these last launches because we're running out of time. Unfortunately, this launch looked really wobbly coming off of the launch pad. It took a little while to get it all lined up. I had to turn the SAS on and off and on and off before I could get any kind of control. And then even as we continue up, it still keeps going out of control. And we've used this Hydra before. So I think what's happening is modifications that are being made to the game all the time continue to make things unstable and older craft are harder and harder to launch. 
Valentina and Kessla are on board. They were heading up there, Valentina as the pilot and Kessla as the science officer to make sure everything would have been okay had we been able to get up there, but we've had to hit the abort sequence, punching out the capsule flies off the top and then starts heading down again right into the ocean off the coast. It looks like Bob is going to have to take a little trip out there on the ship, the KSS Minnow. He'll pick these two up, bring them back to base, interview them, see if he can find out what happened, grab the black box out of the capsule and start analyzing that data, see what we can find about what made this launch go wrong when past Hydras have done just fine. Once we have that info, we can start making some modifications to a version 2 or 3 or 10 or whatever version of the Hydra we're on by now. Once we have those bugs worked out, then we'll send another attempt up to the Constellation. We'll also be launching another module for the Constellation ship and working on one of our automated drones that's going to be going to Duna. We'll have all that and more in the next time on Project Odyssey. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.